On today's podcast, Mitch Boyer. Mitch is a YouTuber, cyclist, and storyteller. We discuss how he's put all three together to make some of the most entertaining fitness content I've seen in a while. Enjoy the conversation. Mitch, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Mark. Excited to be here. Cool. Uh, we're going to have a fun chat about making YouTube videos in the kind of health and fitness niche. Uh, in fact, let's start us off by explaining what is your channel about in a, in a simple summary, and then we'll kind of go backwards and, and look at how you got into it. Yeah, sure. I guess my, my big shtick on YouTube is riding up really steep streets on my road bike. Um, and in general, my channel is about uh, road cycling, but I feel like road cycling can be a little bit like snobby or we forget that we're just a bunch of like grown men wearing like skin tight clothing in public. And so I try to, you know, poke a little fun at it and, and remind us like of what's actually going on. No, indeed. In fact, I I, I found you uh, originally, uh, I f actually forget whether I found you or you found me, but but we, we kind of, we, we shared the dog thing, didn't we? In fact, I'm remembering now, I rode up out to Zwift with my dog and then you basically had a go as well. That was kind of how we came to know of each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that then led and then when i watched your interpretation of that video i can remember thinking and we'll come on to this i can remember thinking wow this guy is way too good for this number of views like the, 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 this is going to go somewhere and, and it was it just i just remember thinking you are putting in a level of effort to your videos that is uh way ahead of where many people with your subscriber numbers would do and i and i love that because that's kind of what i did i thought from the beginning start as you mean to go on and and, and i'd love to see Thank someone you. else doing this it was very cool um let's go back what, what's your background how do you how did you get into it why why do you set up a youtube channel in the first place and where did you come from <laughs> this is a, a big question i guess the short version of uh where i came from when i was growing up i was really obsessed uh with making videos i would take my parents like camcorder as in like it would record to an actual tape and i would make films yeah, with yeah. like my friends and my cousins um and initially edit them just by like stopping and recording on the vhs tape <laughs> um and so ever since i was a little kid that's kind of like what i did um i decided i needed to grow up and and videos weren't going to be like the best path but one way or another it just kept pulling me back so I've had a varied career of doing everything from uh, working in special effects, being a, like an app developer and programmer, uh, being a retoucher, a children's book author, and the latest iteration, and I hope my final form is being a YouTuber. Actually, are you doing YouTube now uh, solely? Is that, is that your, your, your main and only business now? It is, yeah. I always tell people it's uh, full-time work and part-time pay right now. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's growing. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, actually, you mentioned special effects, just in case people are thinking, uh, you know, which Star Wars movie do oh. you work on? Um, <laughs> what was your, because yeah. I, you mentioned to me last time, what you, what, 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 give us an example of the sort of special effects you were doing. So I did mostly motion graphics. So at the end of a commercial, we would work on like end cards where you see all the text fly in or like some kind of 3D animation happen. Um, but we also did some special effects for films. Um, probably the biggest one we did was Drive, that uh, film with Ryan Gosling. The scene, the, yeah, yeah, the Ryan scene Gosling, in the yeah. Uh, yeah. in the elevator where he just pummels the living daylight out of the guy. Yeah, we added the yeah. blood and the splatters to that. So it was a combination of like making like How a cool. tire roll in for like a tire company, and then a lot of blood splatters. And those were the two kind of like yeah. niches that the special effects house I worked at. <laughs> like had actually it's quite it's quite interesting because you you clearly had a background in making content in, in a way that lends itself to, to youtube very nicely um on, and on that point you also you, you mentioned you you did some some writing mm -hmm. um what, what was what was the deal there because i remember when we spoke about last time i remember thinking ah oh, that that makes sense given given how your your videos look on youtube oh thanks man um yeah i guess my writing background making films starting with short films and stuff, that was a big uh, part of it. But the place where I learned the most about writing um, was I got to make a children's book. And so 
um, I made these like photoshopped images of my dog and I kind of, she's like a little miniature dachshund, right? So she weighs 10 pounds and she's, I think you called her something that would fit in Paris Hilton's handbag, which is a really apt description. Yeah. If I, I think if I recall rightly that, that when I um, kind of threw the challenge out to other people to try and ride up out to Zwift with their dog, that, that, that in order for the dog to qualify as a dog, I think there were some rules. And I think one that might have been something like your dog has to be able to survive for 48 hours in the woods alone, uh, as, as mine, mine mine happily would. They, they, they'd be killing bears left, right and centre. <laughs> and, I, and I have to admit, I mean, your, your video was good enough that I let it slide, but I'm not entirely convinced <laughs> your dog would survive. I, I don't think you're wrong. I think she thinks she would, and she would, you know, attempt to be an apex predator. But yeah, about 48 minutes is probably right. Yeah, fine enough. Actually, when I go for a dog walk with my, I, my, my, I have a few dogs, but one of them needs to be walked on his own because he's a bit of a savage, uh, Lincoln, the, the the bull terrier. And whenever he passes people walking three or four, they're oh, little man. that's some dogs. Yeah, they are they are so loud and and aggressive, and and he's looking at them thinking, "What are you <laughs> doing? I, I will eat yeah. you!" And and you know, not blink an, an eye. So yeah, I know what they're like. Yeah. They're loud little dogs. Cool. So, 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 how did so, so from taking photographs of dogs, that went where? So, I basically I photoshopped her to make her the size that she thinks that she is, cool. which was like about like fifteen feet tall and however long. Um, and those images kind of went went viral. Uh, and one thing led to another. I ended up with a, a children's book deal with Harper Collins, one of the like three biggest publishers yeah. in the U.S. And that opportunity uh, i got paired up with an amazing editor um and she taught me so much about writing um ultimately the words that were mine in the children's book by the end were maybe like five percent or ten percent of the words uh which i'm really grateful for now because i just learned so much about how to children's books are a lot like youtube videos where you have to cram a lot in to just a short amount of space yeah. and you have to learn to be concise and you have to learn to keep attention um, because we all have the attention span of a child now. And so that, ex that experience yeah. taught me how to tell like concise stories. Actually, it's interesting. So basically you had a background in, in editing videos and, and creating stories yeah. for children. <laughs> I mean, there, as you say, there is no better way to set yourself up for YouTube <laughs> domination than, 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 than that. Uh, so. Uh, YouTube comes about how? Did, had you had a channel running for a while or did you did you set it up to be a YouTuber? Yeah, what, what was I mean, your kind of transition into I that? I, like a lot of people, um, I watched like some of Casey Neistat's videos and I was like, oh, that seems like fun to do. Really copying him. Like I lived in Brooklyn. It was like too much. Uh, so eventually... Do you have the skateboard? Uh, no, I did. I, I, I didn't have the skateboard. So at least there was that. Um, but yeah, long story short, there was that iteration. There was like, um, I did some like retouching tutorials. The most successful go at YouTube I had was right before the cycling bit. And I ran a fine art print shop where I would, I would make giant prints of, of, uh, fine artists at, at like a super, aggressively reasonable price, which, you know, is why the business didn't work out. But the videos did really, really well. There was nobody on YouTube that that was teaching fine art printing um, at a like decent level that wasn't just incredibly dry. And so I was able to like really move up in that niche really quickly. Um, and that kind of gave me my first taste of like, oh, this is something I could actually do. Um, and ultimately, the the printing business didn't work out. Um, but when I started cycling, I was like, all right, let's try this one. Actually, that's interesting. So you had uh, you had a, a number of subscribers following you for that, for the fine art printing. And then you're like, here's, here's me and some Lycra. Just, you know, what do you think of this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, as you do. I mean, I, I had <laughs> a sort of similar transition in that I started off doing some motorcycling stuff, but it, it, it was it was very, very minimal. I think I had literally a few hundred subscribers before I started putting up more sporting type stuff. So it was a very kind of gradual blend. Occasionally, I get people now saying, oh, I've been here since the motorbike days, but but they're few and far between. So, so how many people were following you when you went 
across, but because you currently you're you're moving towards a hundred thousand subscribers now, aren't you? What are you on like eighty, ninety thousand, something like that? Yeah, I'm like around eighty. Yeah. So how many subscribers did you have when you you started bombarding them with you on a bike? <laughs> I was at like twenty thousand. And then I okay. promptly lost substan- about 10 sub- of them, 10,000. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a substantial <laughs> number. Yeah, because I mean, people get very blasé about numbers, and they think everyone that's on YouTube, uh, it's, it's just easy to get to, to millions. The reality is that the vast majority, I, I forget the numbers, but they're, they're, they're insane. Like 99% of people on YouTube have you know, two subscribers, of which one is their mum or something. And then you've got a very, very tiny percentage that includes everyone from Mr. Beast down to mm-hmm. guys like you and me, and and, and obviously below. So having 20,000 subscribers doesn't sound like a lot to people that are used to watching channels with millions, but the reality is when you're accruing subscribers, 20,000 is a is a lot. I mean, it's a, it's a big number. Um, and so to <laughs> risk it, as it were, by hitting them with something so new is... Uh, uh, did it occur to you to set up a new channel at all? Uh, it didn't just because my channel was my name. Uh, and in hindsight, right, I was really right. torn on that. Like um, at the time I was like, I wish I had set up my printing channel as its own channel under the name of the printing business. Um, but some of the my favorite comments that I get now are from people that say, I started following you when I was printing. I didn't like, I, did, I wasn't interested in cycling, but now because of you, I saw like, oh, cycling might be something I'm into. And now I actually do like ride my bike a lot. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, no, I get a tiny bit of that where people are saying it's a similar sort of thing. You know, I started watching you for one sport that you were into at that time, but but now I'm doing another sport you've, you've transitioned to. Um, I, the reason I was about a separate channel was interesting at the moment. My, my wife, Jen, and I, we're, we're hoping to move house soon and we're hoping to go into the countryside a bit more and that would involve having a house that uh-huh. will need work and and kind of doing up and uh and and i'm looking to uh just very simply monetize that as much as possible because because it's gonna it's gonna wipe out every penny i've got so what we what we're thinking about doing is you know do we present to people that are watching me for fitness content and motivation content oh Today, here's a video on, you know, mm-hmm. Jenna repairing the, I don't know, the, the brick wall in the garden or something. Or do we have a separate channel that is, you know, Jenna in the countryside? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but but when you've got a few subscribers behind you, it's very tempting to try and bring them with you. So it's, it's, it's an interesting one. You, you were just quite bold and said, no, you're going to you're going to watch this and you're going to like it. Yeah, I only know what it's like from my perspective, right? I think from from the viewer's perspective, there's the like you know, my own bias of like, I'm choosing who I'm listening to. I'm sure there were quite a few yes. people that were like, I didn't know I signed up for OnlyFans when they saw me in Lycra. So yeah, bonus. <laughs> Have you checked out um, Becky and Chris on YouTube? No, Do you I know haven't. them? No. They, no so with them, no. your home renovation thing, this might be good. So He's like a a doctor. He flies helicopters. She's a photographer. But then right. also they do home renovations. So their channels like spread out over everything. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's, I'm, I'm generally quite excited about it. We, we, we saw a house, uh, we're looking at moving to Wales, um, and it's it's a bit remote, the house we saw. Might not be the one we end up with, but it had a very large sort of converted barn type thing in the grounds, and, and I was walking around it thinking, this would be amazing to convert into a gym, and and I, I uh-huh. get Jen to do it uh, because I don't want to. <laughs> And she can film. She can film herself doing it. And and but but then I'm, you know, where's the overlap with with what people are watching? It's interesting because I follow a guy, uh, Matt does fitness, big big UK fitness influencer, who built his own house recently, last last year or so, and he would occasionally drop in videos. Yeah, you know, one video would be I ate ten thousand calories in the morning. Typical YouTuber fitness content. And the next video was <laughs> we installed a new bathroom. And it, it was interesting reading the comments because um, obviously some people will watch that, but a lot of people are thinking, "No, please go and you yeah. know eat more burgers because that's what I joined for." Um, that's cool. So, so you you started cycling, you put the cycling on, uh, and did you? How long did it take you to think, "Oh, this this actually works. I'm enjoying this." Yeah, that's a good question. Um... It was tough. It was really, it was actually really 
I was conflicted when I started because I had started cycling with the printing shop. Uh, I closed it down. I was just so stressed with it, running a small business that I had no business running. Um, and I kind of started cycling. It was beginning of COVID. Everything was kind of crazy. And I used it as an outlet to just as a stress relief. Um, and then yeah, being me yeah. after a little while, I was like, why don't I start filming my rides? And there was this dilemma of like, do I keep this thing as just this thing that allows me to like release my stress or do I do what I always do and try to monetize my yeah. hobby? Interesting. Yeah. Do you keep it for you or, or, or do you share it with, with the world? Yeah. Honestly, there are some times where I just wish I was magically independently wealthy and I could just ride my bike for yes. fun. Um but then there are other times I'm like, I'm so lucky to do this as a job. Yeah, no, I, I, I know exactly what you mean. There, there are times when I go on a run and I think, and sometimes I just don't, you know, I, I ran at the weekend. And I stuck a couple of photographs up on Instagram, primarily because the run had allowed us to, to run on, on, on their on their, uh, on their dollar, as it were. Um, and so I kind of felt obliged, but we didn't film it. And I just kind of ran for me. And it was just nice to to not have a GoPro in my hand uh, and, and, and and be constantly on, as it were, and, you know, what, what am I going to say next? And it's nice just to, to step back. So yeah. you start making videos now with, with your cycling. This is where it gets interesting for me, and this is really what I wanted to talk about because you make a style yeah. of video. And I'm going to link to your channel and people can go and watch your stuff. And I think they are going to see big similarities between what we do and uh, the, the the place that I think they're going to see that, mm -hmm. they might even realize that this is what they're seeing. But those that are astute will realize that it's the storytelling and it's the the, the the focus on, yeah, kind of creating that that narrative arc through the, whatever, 10, 15, 20 minutes that, that they're watching. And I, I was watching one of your videos just before we, we, we came on air. And it, it was a clip of you in front of your computer, and I can see you sat at your desk, and in front of you is the editing software that you use, same same as I use. And at a glance, I can see that your editing software looks like, um, actually, what it looks like is when people watch uh, videos of people doing coding in movies, and it's just kind of crazy scenes <laughs> of graphics that nobody really understands, but you're just kind of led to believe that's how people do coding. That's what your screen looks like, which means you have got edits all over the place you are not just talking to a camera for 10 minutes solid your your footage is cutting and you've got different clips being presented and, and, and graphics on top of it it is a very very time consuming process to do that it's also very good because it as you say it kind of keeps people's attention in, in a way that just talking to camera doesn't but it's unusual to see on a channel that doesn't have 500,000 plus subscribers. It was weird when I was doing it and you do it way better than me. I mean, li literally you're, I, I was, I was watching the video thinking I'm going to steal that. You know, there's the, the, these little <laughs> things that you do Thanks. and I was thinking I'm, I'm having that. Um, yeah. How did, was that a conscious decision that you, you thought I'm going to make these, uh, I was going to say way better than they need to be. That That's wrong because everything needs to be as good as you can make it. But, but you are, you are doing something that many people at your level, you know, less than 100,000 subscribers, wouldn't bother doing. Yeah. In fact, most people are a million <laughs> subscribers. There's a lot of people out there with a, with a million subscribers who would just grab a camera, talk to it, and, and yeah, the only time they're going to edit is a nasty jump cut to, to get rid of a, a bit they want to just chop out. There's no thought behind it. You're doing whatever, smash zooms and all sorts of stuff's going on. It's It's a... Uh, yeah, was that a conscious decision, I yeah. guess, is my question. Well, first off, thanks. Uh, and you're a huge influence on on my videos. And watching your stuff, I had started watching your stuff right as I started making the cycling videos. And before that, a lot of my videos were more like tutorial-based. And seeing your stuff and, and your background as a comedian, uh, that was really eye-opening to me. To see like, oh, you can, you you don't have to like, be a skit youtuber you could be in a different niche and also apply some of these storytelling techniques um and so yeah i got to give you credit for like showing yeah. me that that is a as a possibility yeah it's almost it's almost as though if if you if you mentioned someone 
you know, comedic on YouTube, they're immediately going to go to skits uh, and that kind of prank video and stuff. And yet in mainstream kind of film, for example, you, 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 you know, you might have that, that's, that's almost like the kind of the Adam Sandler kind of end of the scale. But, but uh, you, you mentioned Ryan Gosling, uh, Ryan Gosling now has kind of taken on that slightly comedic action hero kind of thing. And so it's quite normal to see people that aren't inverted commas comedians, but, but, but lending comedy to storytelling in a yeah. way that helps it. But on YouTube, there's not many people doing that. They're either they're either outright comedians, look at me pushing my wife in the lake, you know, here's what happened. Or or they're it's a tutorial and it's, you know, just watch me do this, copy this. That there's there's not much overlap. Yeah. And I feel like if you're able to just bring a little life to those other things, it elevates your work so much. So from the editing stuff, and you asked about like my editing process, when I going back to like the VHS tape editing I used to do after that, I, I like had saved up. I got like my first computer. I may or may not have illegally downloaded Adobe Premiere like one or whatever version it was. Um, and it was a whole process to get the footage on the computer, but I would just spend hours trying to just editing the most mundane stuff. Like my friends and I, we would skateboard or, or like literally just like jump off of, uh, like rocks. I, I grew up in Utah. And so lots of rocks, early parkour, but like without the skill. And so the edit was the only thing that could make these things interesting. So we would jump off a rock and I would like freeze frame and zoom in. And that's where I kind of like cut my teeth. And over time I learned, like, if you put this shot next to this shot, it will feel nicer than if you put that shot next to this other shot. And I didn't know what I was learning, but I was just putting in the reps. So I don't even want to calculate how many hours I've edited, but that kind of like obsessive nature <laughs> has carried over into now where I don't even think about like, this is the kind of video I should be making at my level of subscribers. I just have a compulsion to make the video as good as I can. And then an unhealthy uh, view at feeling like it's not as good as I want it to be at the end, which I should probably work on. Yeah, actually, it's interesting because when I was saying that your 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 level is is kind of so far ahead of where you'd expect it to be for someone that's quite new to YouTube, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I, I kind of forget that that you've had this background of editing that that, that, that goes way back beyond YouTube. I, when I started my channel in 2018, I didn't know what a cut was. I mean, I, I, I literally knew nothing. So when I watch your videos. Yeah. I, I am thinking, wow, if, here's a very simple example, and people won't even think of this sort of stuff, but almost every time you're talking to camera, the camera is very, very slowly zooming in or zooming zooming out on, on your face. And so there's a bit of movement going onto the camera, even though it's a, a locked off camera. And it's it's something that when you're watching a video, most people just aren't even aware that that is what is going on. They're not aware that very slowly the camera is zooming in on you. But but for people that are aware of that, you, you spot that and think, oh, that, that's not something that's accidental. You've had to create that effect. And so it's not just a case of talking to the camera, stick it in your editing software, that bit's done. You're now, yeah, I mean, you're, you're now kind of playing with every single second of, of footage that you're seeing. You're doing something to it. It's an incredibly time-consuming process. And so that I only recently started doing it. Fair enough, I started watching a lot of Mr. Beast stuff. And the thing that I took from it, and, and I'll ask you about this in a second with Casey Neistat, I was very, very aware not to take too much from it because I'm not Mr. Beast. Mm. Uh, and my subscribers don't want me to be, I, I guess, I, I expect. Uh, but I, I took the fact that in the first 30 seconds, so much happens, you cannot, you cannot possibly be bored uh, or, or disinterested because there's almost too much to have gone on to have even comprehended what you saw. It's it's almost like I have to keep watching because I don't quite know what I'm in <laughs> for here. Yeah. And and I I have really had to work very hard on implementing that. So I when I look at my first 30 seconds of footage on every video, I I will go back over it and if there's a single shot that lasts more than about 2 seconds, I'll I'll change it and I'll put something else in and I, I watch your stuff and, and you're already doing that. You know, your, your videos just start with a flourish of activity. 
And again, it's stuff that when people are watching videos, they won't even perhaps recognize they're seeing it, but they're not quite sure what's, they, they, they don't recognize the, the, the amount of work that goes into that. Um, the, the reason I mentioned that, Casey Neistat, I also watched his stuff and very, very quickly realized that I wasn't Casey Neistat, so never fell in the trap of trying to be Casey Neistat. Do you do you still find yourself, you know, not? I mean, copying is the wrong word, but it's almost the right word. Do you find yourself watching others and thinking, "Oh, I'll do what he did," and then having to sort of backtrack? Yeah, from, I mean, from that I'm habit? always on the lookout for like what other people are doing and finding little like tips and tricks and seeing. And so, what I've kind of learned over time is, I don't need to like directly imitate a person but there are things that i really like to pick up so like a uh, creator that i'm really obsessed with right now is tom scott and he basically is like a public television uh documentarian but on youtube and he's currently on a break from youtube yeah yeah do, I'm, do you I'm watch his stuff, stuff. Yeah, yeah dude yeah, i love yeah, his stuff yeah and he does everything you describe that mr beast does he does it without the quick cuts the first 30 seconds of his video almost feel like calm, but he's able to find an interesting topic and talk about it and include just enough information to make you like intrigued and he'll pose a question or a thesis at the start of it. And it's enough to hold you and keep you going. And so lately I've been kind of in into that um, because I'm sure uh, your audience is kind of similar. Like my audience, it doesn't watch Mr. Beast for the most part. Uh, and so there is a bit of a difference. Like, how do I, how do I, you know, not act like a, you know, give them a seizure in the first 30 seconds, but I still like hold their interest. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think a lot of it to me is like when the viewer clicks on the thumbnail, I want them in the first like five seconds to feel like, okay, the promise of this thumbnail is going to be like delivered by the end of this video. And so trying to do that in yes. a way that isn't yeah, like, absolutely. today I'm going to drown 500 kittens in this pool. You know, it's, <laughs> it's got to find the right balance. Yeah, that would. Which works. I mean, it, 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 yeah. I mean, no, it's, it's, it's so interesting to hear you say because, because that approach, the Mr. Beast approach absolutely works because <laughs> who doesn't want to see 500 kittens in a pool? Um, mm -hmm. but, but, e but equally, it's, I mean, it, it, it's expensive, you know, kittens aren't cheap. I mean, it, it, there are just simply logistical reasons why you, you can't do it every video. And also, as you say, your audience is, I mean, to an extent, you know, humans are humans and we all like kind of flashy things. It's why even as a you know, 50 year old man, when I watch the, Ryan Gosling again, when I watch the Fall Guy trailer, which is just, you know, one edit after another of action. I'm I'm just, yes, sign me up. So adults still respond to that. Mm -hmm. But but we also need something a bit more than just we blew that thing up. Uh there doesn't it? and so it's it's interesting to find that balance. I I'm always very fearful, but probably because I don't have your your background skills, I'm always very fearful of watching too much of somebody else. And then suddenly I find my content is becoming somebody else's. Um, so I'm almost constantly double checking myself to think, oh, have I just created, you know, a Matt does fitness video or have I just, you know, and, and it's, it's only really probably the last six months, the last year, maybe where I thought, okay, that feels like a Mark Lewis video, um, as a, a and anybody watching it that knows my channel would, would hopefully agree your stuff again. It's when I watch your videos and I watched, you know, Thanks. a few of them back to back, they just feel like a, a Mitch video. It's um, which is is, is very very cool. <laughs> so, so I was curious about yeah. how are you? I mean, in simple terms, how are you finding it being a YouTuber in, in terms of the you know day to day? Just yeah, the existence that because people assume it must just be so cool. Wake up, grab a GoPro. Uh, you know that that's half the battle. But, but, but what's it like? day to day for you what's your your process for, for it's just work? amazing every single day every single hour <laughs> it's a, it's hard you know Kittens i always feel everywhere. bad like <laughs> being being honest about it because there are some really amazing moments like youtube has sent me around the world 
Um, I've been to like some really amazing, beautiful places and done some really cool things and, and met amazing people. And then other days, which are the majority of the days, I'm like stressed out of my mind. My wife is like telling me to calm down <laughs> and I just like have my like fifth coffee of the day and wondering if I'm ever going to figure this like video out. So I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a roller coaster. Um, this year is, is every year that I, I, so I've, I've been doing the cycling YouTube for about like two and a half years now. So I think I'm still kind of like early on in my journey there, but each year I've kind of been learning yep. a different lesson. And this year's lesson has been not to take on too much. Uh, I got really excited. I had a couple like videos that popped off at the end of the year for like my niche and all of a sudden I got all of these opportunities and I said yes to probably too many of them. And so the first half of the year, I've only put out four videos so far uh, when I wanted to put out eight. And a lot of that has been not because I don't have the time, but because I'm so overwhelmed, I like freeze. And it's hard to be creative and to come up with like a good story when I'm just like, so stressed out. So I'm learning how to kind of like balance the business side and the opportunity side and all everything else. Um, and the further I go down, the less time I'm making videos. And so it's, you know, it's, it's finding that balance. Yeah, you got you got to say no yeah. to a lot. Um, it, it, it's hard, isn't it? Because when you start YouTube, you're desperate to say yes, to, to anybody, because because that means that someone's asked you something and that in itself would just be delightful. I can remember the first time someone offered me a free bit of motorcycle gear. I had like 12 subscribers. I was over the moon. A free jacket I got. I still have that jacket to this day. I, I was just, I, I can remember thinking, I'm going to become, uh, well, I'm going to become Casey Neistat. He used to have that kind of Tuesday thing where he would open all the boxes of the things he'd been <laughs> sent. I thought that's going to be me and I can't wait. But then you realize that most of the stuff you're being offered is just junk and and even if it's not there comes a point where you just don't have time for it so in the last couple of days i've been offered some crazy expensive mattress that will cool my sleep down and and, and an ice tub that will freeze me in the garden and and the gut reaction still is of that brand new youtuber which thinks a freebie an opportunity for content please you know send it my way but then i'm also thinking hang on a minute and what? What am I going to do with that? Well, I make a video about an ice bath and be one of the other, you know, forty-eight thousand people this week that have done that. So I just say, so I say no. I say, I say, I, I enjoy saying no to, yeah, a lot now, and I have to remind myself that that's not a bad thing. Um, so, so your your routine is what? Because you say you've only done four videos this month. We're, we're, we're nearly in April. What, what, what's your your uh, what's your routine for sending out a video? How how often do you like to get one out? I have been trying to do two a month. Um, right. And so January had two, February had one, uh, March will have one. <laughs> and uh, my routine, so yeah, there's a, the you know, everybody's got their own strengths and stuff. And so my strength, I think, is being able to come with like a unique story and something interesting and my edit skills can kind of elevate everything. Uh, my weakness is I'm not the most organized person. And so I'm trying to find that kind of like uh, balance between the two. And right now, the thing that's keeping me kind of like sane and okay is that I've got like a lot of like really exciting stuff lined up for the rest of the year. And so I'm kind of taking it as like, all right, maybe this wasn't deliberate, but it's good that I'm going a little bit slower at the beginning of the year because things are about to ramp up and I probably need to just like take a little breathing time right now and get ready for what's to come. Actually, something that would be interesting, just to kind of let people in um, on, on the sort of stresses that go through the mind of a YouTuber, you you are you are setting up and then creating some some fairly um, big project videos. You know, they're, they're not things... That, for, as an example, I'm doing a video this week. It will go up on Sunday about fixing my bad back. Mm -hmm. And I haven't... I, I've written the only thing I've written is the opening line, which is a joke about 
a bulging disc. And it's a, just a joke about bulges, basically. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> so as far as I've got so far, that video, this video will be up on Sunday. At the moment, it, the, the, it consists of, I've had a problem with my body, bulges and not the good ones, or something like that. That's as far as I've got. But I'll be able to turn that into a video that will be up and it'll be out on Sunday because I don't need to do anything other than walk around my fields here talking to camera about my bad back. And and so there's no pressure really. That video is well, great. If it doesn't do so well, well it took me three days. But every now and again, I do something that involves traveling somewhere and doing something and, and spending some money. And 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 then the pressure is on. And, and your videos are almost all like that. So do, do you find you when you hit upload, what's the what's the pressure like? Because I'm imagining significant. The pressure for me is front loaded. Uh, and so I. Right. Again, it's to that, like, there's so much going on. I get overwhelmed and then I just kind of like freeze. That's what happens. I'm like, I design my thumbnails before right. I film anything. I come up with the title before I film anything. I have a big old. Like I've got a whiteboard in front of me and it's got the whole story outline for this next video that I'm working on. Everything's kind of planned. And that's the moment where I experience like a creative block where I'm overthinking like, what if this doesn't get it? By the time I hit upload, I have procrastinated so much that I have to fit the entire video's worth of work in a few days. And if I upload at 4 a.m., uh, I've been up the entire night uploading to the last second and I'm so stressed, there's no space to worry about how this video is going to perform. So the stress comes, it's front loaded. And then it comes after the upload, uh, where like after I pass out and I wake up a few hours later, I open up YouTube studio, I hit refresh. And if that number isn't like on the ranking of like one to 10 and one being the best performing video out of the last 10, if it's not on the upper like 50% of those, then the stress starts all over again. Yeah, to to explain it, yeah, to explain that 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 one to ten uh, for people, when you have a YouTube channel and you put a video up, it will tell you almost instantly. Certainly within within a couple of hours, it will tell you where that video has ranked versus the last ten videos you've put up. So, in other words, uh, is it performing better or worse than your most recent content? And it's a it's a big deal. It's interesting. It's a big deal for everybody because I heard Mr. Beast talking recently in, in, in an interview in a podcast where he was saying that yeah he stresses about that, and, and for him the stress is that number one on his list also happens to be number one on the whole of YouTube. <laughs> so when, when he's thinking, yeah. will this video be the best one I've done in the last ten? He needs to he needs to have you know tens of millions of views. So everybody worries about it, and and I have. I'm really struggling to let go of it. Uh, and, and what I try and do is I watch other YouTubers, and something that's quite useful to do actually is to look at other people of a similar size to you mm. and look at their best performing video. And and many of them, I mean, as you do, you've, you've got videos that are up, you know, many hundreds of thousands, uh, but you also have videos that are down in the tens of thousands. Mm. And, and then you do start to realize, oh, okay, everybody has highs and lows, and so you 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 can't expect huge numbers every time, and it's also all relative. If someone's got two million subscribers and their video gets two hundred thousand views, you and I would regard that as a as a as a decent mm -hmm. video. They might regard two hundred thousand views with two million subscribers as being a bit of a disaster <laughs> yeah. for them. So it's it's not it's not always the same. But but no, it's it's interesting that that you you do still stress about that um, because yeah, you're. I mean, I I just. I, I I almost shy away now from doing the big event videos for fear of of the effort that goes into them and and the results that come out. If only because some of my best performing videos have been uh -huh. so little effort that it almost it almost makes me think, um, what, why bother? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, when, when you are trying to be commercial with it, it, it's frustrating that it's not a simple meritocracy between the you know the quality yeah. of the video equals what you will earn. That yeah, I've had some videos where, works. especially towards the beginning, I invested all this time and money going and traveling. I have like, I thought for a second, I had watched a lot of going back to like YouTubers you emulate. I had watched a lot of this um, cyclist who's now called VC Adventures. He was called Vegan Cyclist in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tyler. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know Tyler. 
Okay, yeah. So yeah, I, we, I had yeah. watched a lot of his videos. He does these epic rides. And so I was like, yeah. oh, okay. And he would get a lot of views. Um, and so I, the epic rides looked awesome. I wanted to experience an epic ride for myself, similar to Casey Neistat. I guess I'm like, oh, I want to like emulate this. And so I spent all this money. I went on these like big rides. I did one ride where I rode from like Miami all through the Florida Keys uh, to the end. It was like the longest ride I'd ever done. I did another one where I rode all the way across the loneliest road in America. Both of those videos like flopped. That was so frustrating. It was, and I was so confused yeah. because I I had had other videos like I made like a review of a 360 camera that had like five times the number of views and I had produced in a weekend. And um, now I spend a lot of time thinking about what the video concept is, like the core idea of the video and how that... Um, will perform. So I have, I'll come up with a bunch of ideas and then I have like a filter that I send it through. And so it has questions like, um, do I think this is a video that could get more than 200,000 views? And I'll go look at other videos and kind of see that. Is this a video that excites me? Is this a video that I think somebody who's not a road cyclist would be interested in? And I think going through that process helps a lot to mitigate the, the, fear that I would feel before embarking on that. And I don't, you know, I don't have a perfect batting average with it. I still have videos that like, like you said, will have like hundreds of thousands of views and others I will have tens of thousands of views. Um, but I'm slowly kind of learning how to refine that funnel so that the ideas that I, that I come up with uh, that do make it through that funnel seem to hit more and more. Yes. No, it, ma it makes perfect sense that, that the problem is the algorithm and, and how YouTube decides to throw your content out to the world doesn't make uh, to, to, to anybody other than YouTube much sense. And so there are, there are many times where I've thought this video, I mean, sometimes it works perfectly. I did a video last year where I ran, ran a track. And I tried to run as fast as the little kid that holds the park run world record. And I thought, it's beautifully simple. It's easy. It, it, anybody can watch it and understand it. It's a, it's a grown man, a huge grown man. Um, I was in great shape at the time, so I, I, looked, I looked like a typical fitness YouTuber idiot. And this little tiny kid, I just thought that has all the, the, kind of the, the, the magic to, to do well. And, and be enjoyed by people whether they like running or not. And and it did. It, it went up and immediately went in at number one and it's just gone past a million and, and, and all is all is great. So sometimes that happens and it, it makes perfect sense. Other times, I think this video is almost the same as one like that and therefore we'll do at least something close to that and it just doesn't. And and I look at the numbers, and everything on my side appears good. Uh, the, yeah, the, the the retention, how long people are watching for, is good. The likes is good. Uh, the click through rate. So for, for people that don't know, that's the, the the ratio of people that are presented with your thumbnail by YouTube to people that then click on your thumbnail. That's very important, and that will be good. But YouTube just won't be sending it out to many people to see. And I'll be thinking, this this makes no sense. And and. It's hard sometimes to, um, to, I mean, I, it must be like any any artist that, that that just kind of, you know, why is my work not not kind of getting through to the public? Um, it, it's frustrating. I don't think people realise um, the, the the level of of stress that it's not just a case of it's fun to make video and now I'll make another one. You've made it <laughs> and now you've got to spend yeah. sometimes weeks wondering what's going on with it. Because sometimes things will pick up a bit later on for no obvious reason. I did a video recently where it was a me. Uh, actually, I'll tell you what it was. It was a it was a video where a guy had sent me his weight loss journey, and I watched it and was just inspired by it and thought this is amazing. So I said to him, "Look, I'm going to stick it on my YouTube channel." And I even said to him, "I said, look, I tell you what I'll do. I'll split all the money with you. This thing makes in the first six months because." You know, I don't want to kind of, I, I hate on YouTube when people use other people's content and, you know, man reacts to this kind of thing and 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 no one's, you know, the only person that gains is the person making the new video. So I said, we'll, we'll do this. And I kind of suggested you'll make a, you know, a few hundred dollars maybe. 
and and it did terrible and i couldn't understand why it was it was classic cliched transformation youtube nonsense but also very very genuine and inspiring and then for no apparent reason after about three or four weeks of doing just rubbish it suddenly decided to do really well and youtube throws it out to millions of people and off it goes and i'm just left kind of wondering why it's 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 frustrating isn't yeah. it yeah it can always be hard like until until the youtube algorithm starts finding that new audience and it's hard you never know like is this is this a video that is going to pop off later or or is it just a dud um yeah it's stressful I'm trying to understand all that yeah uh, th 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 i've got i got i got a question now about the, the style that you make videos, that, that, that there's a slight risk to, to, to you um, saying, <laughs> no, I don't agree with that at all. You, you're, there's something wrong with you. Um, uh, does it frustrate you when you look at the amount of effort and time and work that you're, you're putting in? And the, the answer must be, yes, of course it frustrates you. When you then look at what some people on YouTube are doing, I don't mean the Mr. Beast stuff, because clearly it, it, Mr. Beast is spending millions of pounds every video, so that, that guy is putting in more effort than anybody. But there are some people that will just, you know, whether whether you know, an iPhone 11 will just, you know, film their dog jumping on a piano and it goes and gets 50 million views. How do you cope with uh, seeing other people in your same medium, YouTube, absolutely destroy you in terms of wealth and success and all the kind of obvious metrics when when the quality of their product by any sensible measure is light years behind yours does it does it like me keep you up at night and drive you nuts <laughs> or have you found a way to simply come to terms with it yeah. and if you have what is it <laughs> yeah i think the the experience of like going viral with those photoshopped images of my dog like really has helped in that area because and also with the print shop i have had these experiences of like what it's like to find like a like small amount of success in these other areas um and the level of difficulty on both of them was much lower than it has been with the cycling channel the dog photoshop images doing and this will probably make people who do uh animal content a little upset is playing on easy mode like that is the easiest money like i got an eighty thousand dollar book deal with having no publishing experience from probably about 15 hours of photoshop work okay i'm, I'm going to go and find my dog right now <laughs> it was like crazy um and so i've had that experience of like what they're doing and so i kind of kind of see like all right they're not putting in as much effort but i respect the hustle still it's still it's still work Yes. Um, and so, I don't know, maybe it's just like, I refuse to like, let myself think about that. Um, but I don't know, I've worked a bunch of different jobs in a bunch of different industries. And each one has its own like difficulties. And frankly, some are easier. And that's just the way it is. Um, and I've chosen this little niche, and I've stubborn enough to kind of like stick with it. And so there's no value right now to me thinking about like what could have been um, all I, I barely have the headspace to just focus on what I'm doing. So, you know, I'm so <laughs> that sounds, that sounds, that sounds a pretty, pretty healthy way to go. I mean, the, the only thing I've ever found that gives me some sort of um, solitude is, is thinking that it must be similar for, for guys like, you know, Scorsese when he, when he produces a, uh, an Oscar nominated movie to see how his numbers at the box office compare to, mm -hmm. you know, whatever superhero nonsense yeah. is floating around at the same time and, and how he gets absolutely crushed at the box office by, by those people with a, um, at least by some metrics, an inferior product. Um, I mean, I don't know how he'd feel if he was getting crushed by a person <laughs> that kind of filmed their dog jumping on a piano. Um, probably, he'd probably feel even worse. <laughs> But I, I try and I tell myself, it sounds very pompous, but I tell myself that I'm like the kind of Scorsese in, in that sense. And, and therefore, uh, it allows me to feel okay about myself, um, despite the fact that, I mean, YouTube's tricky because you mentioned your, your career thus far has kind of prepared you for the, 
the fact that sometimes people just do well for a relatively small amount of work from the outside at least my previous career was in financial services and sales where mm. it, it was quite literally you were rewarded for how good you were at selling i mean it was as simple as that so the person that sold the most made the most money it was just as it was yeah. very very straightforward and and so to come into an artistic endeavor while it is a million times better in a million different ways it, it it's completely lost that well you're better than him so you will do better than him that doesn't exist in the arts um uh, yeah and it's just it's and just you tough even life. it's interesting because it goes the other way too like your views if you look up the numbers of you know traditional television shows even premieres um, or their average episode views your videos are getting more like you have more people watching yes. your youtube videos than you know network television shows or shows on the bbc or channel four or where whatever it, and that's kind of like crazy to think about that just you know we can be in in our homes filming something and have a, a larger reach than these huge network tv shows and there's uh you know they're making more money and they're they're <laughs> have more yes. cachet yeah uh it's uh, yeah it, it's as soon as you start doing something creative it's a dangerous it's dangerous to compare because it'll rip you apart real fast yeah, indeed. And I'm sure there's also someone that's incredibly highly qualified gym instructor out there who's trying to make kind of, you know, fitness tutorials thinking, yeah. why is that 50 year old bloke that doesn't know what he's doing and just, just makes jokes about <laughs> bulges getting, getting anybody, anybody watching him, you know, what's going yeah, on? There's, you, there's no fairness in the world. You know, whose um, videos I'm completely confused by the view counts. Um, Dodford, do you know, I, I think we might've talked about this before in the past. Yes. Uh, he, yeah, we he did. Yeah, does yeah, these yeah. amazing yes. documentaries, and some of them get millions of views, and then others will be like barely a hundred thousand, and they're they're made yeah. just as well. And for whatever reason, one subject or one like uh, director that he's focusing on will just have more uh, viewer interest at this moment, um, and I don't fully understand it. And I think it's a good reminder for myself at least that even when i am creating something in the same series because all his videos are about like some crazy experience this this like filmmaker had making their a movie or their career and yet the views are so inconsistent and so that helps me sleep a little at night i feel bad for dodford because i feel like I, yeah. <laughs> he must be stressed out of his mind it, when it, once something doesn't perform as well but uh <laughs> it makes me feel better <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it, it is it is stressful. I mean, I, I was looking just today at some of my recent numbers. Actually, I was looking at my my performance of videos over the last 28 days. And what was interesting was that my best performing video, in fact, my best three performing videos over the last 28 days were all videos that I put up last year. So it's it's videos that went from a million to a million 250,000 in the last 28 days. And I look at that, I think, well, well I put up a video there that I worked on this month and got a hundred thousand views. A, a video that I did last year got more than double that just by doing nothing. I could have just not bothered putting up a video. I could have just done no, done nothing whatsoever, and my kind of back catalogue would have uh, would have filled in the gaps. Uh, although I, I guess that what I'm putting up today becomes my back catalogue for next year to fill in the gaps where, where next year comes along. It's uh, it's almost impossible. As long as your stuff is evergreen, uh, it's almost impossible to know what will happen. Uh, you, you you can find things just just blow up for, as you say that the, the algorithm just decides it's now going to send it out and uh, and see what happens. Um, so I wanted to, to finish off on it and just just know about and, and how you deal with it if if you have it. Do you have uh, lunatics contact you in the, in the comments and the, and the, and if you do, how do you, how do you deal with that? Because because your channel you're a bit older than the average YouTuber, mm -hmm. not as old as me. Um, and I think that kind of filters out some some nutcases, but but you are in the fitness kind of entertainment world, and that just does attract loons. Do you have them, and and yeah. what do you think of them, and how do you deal with them? You know, interestingly, there were more in the printing niche than there are in the cycling really? niche. And my theory is that because those fine art, nut yeah, cases. yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and it's like it was very technical. I would talk about specific like pigments to use and the black point and and different papers and this is how like dark this could and we would go into like physics of light and everything. 
And that just opened me up to all of this, like, criticism of like, oh, you misunderstood this, like, point, and this is what's right. And, and that tore me apart, because I had a huge amount of imposter syndrome. A lot of the stuff I was learning as I was going, or I had just recently learned within like a year or so. And so I was teaching like as I was learning. Um, and so getting those comments really yes. hit to my core. And I was like, they're, maybe they're right. Maybe I did like do this wrong. And it stressed me out so much. And that, in addition to the <laughs> failing business side, was why I pulled the plug on that. Um, I literally developed rashes all over my body. And my wife was like, you need to stop this. Like, this is bad. Um, which ultimately <laughs> led me to like being healthier and, and cycling and everything. With cycling, yeah, I, of course, I get I get some. Uh, but I've positioned myself deliberately on my channel to not be an expert, to kind of almost be like this bumbling beginner. Um, and I think part of that is just me protecting myself from from that. The comments that are like, you know, like you're dumb, you're, you're so stupid. Those, they, I don't, they don't bother me. Like I would prefer not to have them, but they don't bother me. The ones that really, really hurt. I have one comment I think about all the time. I rushed to get a video out um, because I felt obligated to like, it was like at a period where I was like, I need a weekly upload. And I basically cobbled together a bunch of footage. There was no cohesive storyline. And I've kind of built my brand around this idea of like, telling a story and there's going to be you know a conflict and a resolution throughout yeah. this yeah. video and this one didn't have it and this person commented um and i think they were like dutch or something so very very dutch they're like uh what is this video even about <laughs> just like very directed to the point and i think about that all the time and uh that more than anything has like uh, killed videos <laughs> that I'm working on for better and for worse, because I'm like, ah, I can't, the comments that like hit something that I already feel, those are, those are, they can be rough. It's funny because I've had exactly the same comment a few times and it is a comment that would only upset somebody that is trying to tell a story Yeah, because there are a million YouTubers out there who, if you said, well, you wouldn't even you wouldn't even put the criticism, what is this video about? Because the video is just nonsense from start <laughs> to finish. It, it, it's just, you know, a lot of a lot of people are just doing vlogs. What is it about? It's nothing. It's just following me on my day. You know, it, 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 it has no story. But if you are trying to create setup, conflict, resolution, the way stories have been told since sat around the campfire days to today, if you're trying to do that, someone saying, what what was this about? Uh, and unless you were deliberately trying to be a bit confusing, it is going to hurt in a way that it's not going to hurt. Yeah, the, the guy with his <laughs> yeah. iPhone and his dog and his piano. That 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 guy isn't bothered. Uh, yeah, what's it about? It's about my dog jumping on the piano. You know, were you not paying attention? So no, it's, it, it's almost, it's good that you're hurt by that because it shows you're trying to achieve something that a lot of people on YouTube just aren't bothering to achieve. Um, and, and you're very sensible as well. The, the not be an expert thing is, I mean, I did the same. I say it all the time. I'm not an expert, which means when someone, I mean, people just don't criticize me for getting things wrong, typically. And when they do, funnily enough, the video I mentioned about me chasing around after a little kid, at the, 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 the people need to go and watch that video in case they're wondering what the heck I'm talking about, chasing a kid around a park. Um, the, somebody said to me, on that video, they, they, they basically did a long spiel uh, about how my running technique was bad. <laughs> and I said, you, you're overthinking this, mate. Uh, I'm, an, I'm just an old bloke messing about. You know, that, that's all there is to it. It's not, it's not a running channel. It's not how to run. It's just, isn't this kid fast? And isn't that old man not fast? That, that's it. Um, and, and then the, the, the converse of that is when someone does, I'm sure you get this all the time, when someone says yeah, just great best. storytelling, is, is there is there any better comment that you can get than that? I mean, it just, yeah. When someone says you tell a great story, and I've had that comment on, it could be a video about my testosterone replacement therapy, my cycling, my running, or, or how I got it when I did a video about how I got my motorbike that sits behind me, uh, and people just say, yeah, nice story. And I need one person to say that. You know, thousands can say something else, but if one person says, 
I like what, yeah, I see what you did there. A nice story. That's just, um, that makes it all worthwhile, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is the, it's the best. <laughs> I screenshot those. I have a little folder of them. And so sometimes when I'm feeling really down, I'll kind of go through those and then <sighs> remember it's possible. That, that, yeah, that's a good idea. I, I do, I do the opposite. When I get a complete <laughs> lunatic, um, I, I I screenshot it and I, I do one of two things. I either pin it, especially if the video is doing really well. Nice. I'll pin it to the top. Uh, I'll, make, I'll make one little one-liner that shows my disapproval of it. And I then allow my quite loyal subscribers to then just rip that person apart. So that, that's always quite amusing. Nice. So I do yeah. that. The, the pin of shame, people call that. So I do that. Alternatively, I'll take it and I'll use it in my Friday podcast where me and Jen just kind of chat about the week, and, and we'll just we'll, we'll have a you know don't read the comments section where we say well we you know we did, and and this is the most lunatic version of that today. I think I think the funniest one that that still sticks with me is, is a guy that commented on a video of of Jen going for a run, doing, doing, doing an ultra marathon, I think, and his comment was just uh, your wife comma sit on my face question mark <laughs> and. And, and what can you do with that other than <laughs> laugh at it? I mean, it's just, in every sense, it's it's insane. Like, what would make someone think to write it? What would make someone worry about, you know, commas and question marks and good grammar when doing so? <laughs> it just, the, the hot, it's just like, what is going for that person's head? So a lot of people I know, Jen, she told her friends, uh, she, she's laughing about it, and her friends are horrified that, that you know that she's kind of exposed to this kind of you know the evil yeah. on the on the internet. But actually, um, if you can laugh about it uh, and and remind yourself that on that video, for example, it had been seen like five hundred thousand times, and uh, yeah, you know, half a million people just watched it and enjoyed it. Hopefully, and one person is a, is a nutcase. <laughs> yeah. Who cares? Um, but but it is it's easy to take those those one negatives and kind of give them a sort of a gravitas that they just don't deserve oh man i love when it's like they feel like they're insulting you but you actually just agree with it like i had one where it was like <laughs> like how did you get your wife like you're so ugly you must be like rich or something and i was like yeah i'm pretty lucky to get her i don't know how it happened and <laughs> i just imagine I, them seeing the I little get, pop yeah. up and i'm like uh they're probably like oh <laughs> i don't know it happens. I, I get it because because Jen's fifteen, sixteen years younger than me. So I often get comments like, um, "You know, how's you know you're working out with your daughter again and stuff like that." And I just I just go to comment. Go, no, that's my hot <laughs> wife. That's not you know that's not my daughter. That's uh, yeah. She's crazy young, isn't she? Like you know, yeah, yeah. Well done, me. Thanks for noticing. Uh, <laughs> but it is again. It's just funny. I've never watched someone on YouTube. I've watched people on YouTube and thought I don't like this. I will watch something else. Uh, but I've never thought I don't like this. I'm <laughs> I know, personally yeah. insult the person. It, it just wouldn't even. What what occurs to someone to, to to put them in that place where they're, you know, I've I've made comments. I suppose I might have made comments if someone's got something completely wrong. It, it might occur to me to make a comment, perhaps. But um, but just a, a straight up, you know, an insult to to someone, it's just, yeah, it's just a it's a weird thing to spend your time doing, even if it only takes you the shortest amount of time, um. Yeah, especially but, but, but when it's like a novel. There. They've written like a ten thousand word essay on something. I love just not even like reading it. <laughs> just feeling, oh, it's not worth it. <laughs> just, I don't have time. Or, or, or what? Well, sometimes what's even funnier is if they start it off by saying something like, um, uh, "Your stuff's quite funny," but, and then they just they just spiel out a whole long list of problems. Mm -hmm. I'll just put at the bottom. Um, uh, you had me at funny, and and like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like the idea that someone's thinking, no, they they didn't read it. That's that's so annoying. Do, yeah, do you great. um do you have a filter for for comments on? Do you, do you deliberately filter anything out, or do you just? I just let them all roll in right now. I am starting right. to get to the point. I've noticed my last it, last year, um, I kind of like entered a new tier on view counts, and I have noticed there's a lot yeah. more people that just obviously aren't my core audience. I have like an amazing core audience, like you mentioned, like you're loyal like audience there are a lot of people that that i would consider all, like internet friends because i see them in the comments all the time we'll make yes we'll have conversations yeah. down there and so i want to hold on to that but it is getting to the point where it's like i cannot like sort through all these comments because a lot of them are like what we were just talking about these like 
novels or they're like just like hitting on my wife or they're like trying to insult me and like i don't i don't have the time to like sort through all of these to try to like have these conversations with the people that i actually care about and so i don't know it's a dilemma i'm trying to solve right now do you have you have yes. filters set up i i do it's it's a it's a tricky one because with 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 your 80 90 thousand uh yeah 80 thousand subscribers you you've you've probably got yeah, 100 or 200 people that would just kind of, you know, lay, lay down their life for you. You, you then have 10,000 people probably who are just real hardcore fans and love what you do. And then another 20,000 who just love it. And, and then a bunch of people just subscribe uh, and don't even watch your stuff. I mean, that, that's just the way the way that is. Um, so what what happens, I'm now, in fact, literally just a couple of days ago, we went through 300,000 subscribers and it's got to the point, frustrating and disappointingly, where I can't go through all the comments. So when when a video goes up initially, I'll definitely jump in there because the people that are straight on it are subscribers because they're the ones that get the video first. So I'll, I'll spend an hour or so on a Sunday when I've just put a new video up, interacting with people. But but after that, it's just kind of potluck as whether I happen to catch the comment on my on my when I'm looking on my phone and and, and just seeing a comment come in. And and it's disappointing because, uh, you yeah, know, when someone's been nice, it, it's it's so nice to reply and people really appreciate it. I mean, people that Instagram me, DM yeah. me on Instagram, and I reply and just say, you know, thanks for being nice. They're they're blown away that you've bothered to do that. So it's disappointing you can't do it for everybody. But there comes a point where if a video is getting a thousand comments, it, it, it's just it's just not practical. I, I then have filters set up, so a whole bunch of words that that get captured. Um, one of the ones that very annoyingly I have to do is things like congratulations, because lots of the WhatsApp scammers will do that kind of, hey, congratulations, you've won a prize and pretend to be me. You know, so I, I catch a lot of those. I also filter out anybody using words to do with steroids and testosterone and so on, uh, not to stop them, but but just so that I can oversee those comments, because a lot of the comments are great and sensible and, and they obviously filter through. But a lot of people are just are just people just being abusive um, or... or, or um, or being very unconstructive. Uh, I, I heard a great comment. I think it was Chris Williamson, the the, the um, or Chris Williams, I forget his name, but the, the 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 top big big podcast guy over here in the UK. He said that his comments section is, it's like his house. It's like you're you're welcome to come in, but don't put your feet on the furniture, and and that's how he treats his comments section. It's it's his comments section. It's not YouTube. It's it's his. So if you're going to go in there, um. You have to kind of, you know, play by the rules. So when people are just being abusive or stupid or or just argumentative to the point of disruption, I just delete them now. I don't I don't I used to think, um, oh am I am I kind of censoring someone's comments? But now I just think, no, if you're an idiot, you deserve to have your comments censored uh, by <laughs> me in in my comment section. You know, you you're not censored by society. Go and stand on the street corner and yell what you like. But you know, not in my house kind of thing. Um, you, you have that. I mean, it gets worse. I remember 100,000 subscribers onwards. Mm -hmm. Your ratio of people that have never seen your stuff and get shown it by YouTube goes higher. Mm -hmm. And that's when you encounter, yeah, people that are new to you and, and not all of them will <laughs> like you. Oh, boy. I can't wait. <laughs> uh, dude, it's been, it's been awesome chatting. Where can people find your stuff? What, what's the easiest way for them to get hold of you and, and see what you're doing? Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, just my YouTube channel. It's my name, Mitch Boyer, uh, B-O-Y-E-R. And I'm cool. on Instagram too, but I'm not, you know, super active there. Cool. So people can just type in Mitch Boyer. I'll, I'll stick a link as well so people can go and find your stuff. And they should go and find it because if you enjoy my stuff, I'm pretty certain people will enjoy yours because it, it's got the storytelling. It, it's it's edited brilliantly. Um, it is it, it is genuinely a channel that I'm sure when people watch, they'll they'll think, uh, why is this not a guy not got you know five hundred, six hundred thousand subscribers? Because your your content is good enough to have that. A lot of people, you think, as they get bigger, they're gonna have to get better. They're gonna have to up their game to match their subscriber numbers. You're you're doing it, um, and it's the best way. You're doing it the wrong way around almost. <laughs> you, you you have six hundred thousand subscriber content level uh, with 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 less subs, but. Uh, undoubtedly going to get there uh actually what, what's your what's your do you have a target do you have a a point in the future where you think it'd be nice to have x at this point or do you just let it flow as it happens i would love to hit a hundred thousand this year um the inside baseball that i've heard is that 
uh, subscriber count doesn't matter as much as it used to. So my goal this year yeah. is I want to have um, six videos that get over 250,000 views, which is like, that's a good number for me right now. And yes. so it's like view count per video is like the real thing that I'm kind of shooting for. But I also want to say before we kind of yeah. close up, thank you for your channel. Because uh, like I said earlier, huge inspiration uh, to me and showed me that like, you can put a little humor and some story into something, even if it's not, you know, a skit comedy channel. In fact, I like the fact that you say I've inspired you because I then watch, as I say, I watch your stuff and I think I'm stealing that. So it's it's nice when it kind of goes full oh, circle. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Cool. Superb. Great talking and uh, yeah, look forward to chatting again soon. Sounds good. Anytime.